Hey folks, this is Rabble Rouse and Rich Bergeron. Ladies and gentlemen, the Tornado Tony Pennycap. And Psychic Tom Padgett with me. Pocket full of predictions. About that for a little alliteration there, huh? Yeah. A powerful pocket of, of, of predictive possible probabilities. There you go. <laughs> I keep seeing these psychic commercials more and more now, too. It's funny. It's like every time I see them, I'm thinking of you. Yeah. It's a, it's a <laughs> yeah everything goes in cycles. Uh, the 90s was a peak, then it kind of slowed down, but now maybe it's <laughs> coming back in a different form. No more 900 numbers. Well, we've kind of talked about Cowboy Cerrone and... Um, Conor McGregor, before it even happens, before before we even did the show last week anyway. Um, but uh, I pretty much said, uh, you know, Conor likes to start fast, so if Cowboy can survive, pretty much everybody else said, too, that was an expert. You know, Cowboy yeah. can survive, well, he has a good it, chance. Because it was true. Yeah. And 40 seconds is all he could survive. He's getting a lot of shit in the uh, Facebook world, but, uh, you know, you win some, you lose some. Hey, he lasted uh, more than twice as long as Jose Aldo, <laughs> so, uh, you know, he has that anyway. But, uh, yeah, I kind of had a feeling that two TKOs in a row there was uh, the sign for McGregor to say, yeah, I want him, I want to come back against him, but. <coughs> he still has no interest in a Khabib rematch, and uh, he seems to be more leaning towards boxing again before he does another MMA fight, which is kind of crazy. But Dana White hates the idea, so I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I, I, the breaking news now, along those lines, I just discovered this today. Uh, Bob Arum's got a great idea to um, raise the profile of... Uh, Karen Bud Crawford. He's looking for a two fight deal with McGregor. One fight will be boxing and the other will be then the other will be MMA because supposedly Crawford has a, a grappling background. Hmm. Now I believe that's when I see it. Right. Because right. the argument right. against the the argument against it is Bob Aaron hates the UFC. Bud Crawford, yeah, you know, and there's all this talk about well, I, I know, but, I, but I'm saying that there's all this talk about Crawford being number one pound for pound. I mean, I, I don't, I respectfully, he, the jury's out. I look at his record. But the point is, he's not a mega star. He's not a Manny Pacquiao. He's not a Floyd Mayweather. And I think right now, now he's just been desperate, calling out Spence, call, calling out everyone. And then and Porter answered the call, and he didn't, you know, didn't follow up on that. But I think that the idea would be raise his profile. Right. And uh, possibly that would uh, lead to a, a Spence fight or a Pacquiao, or some, something bigger than what he's got going now. Uh, but with Bob Arum involved, I don't know. I, I just think there's so many obstacles. I want you to see what you guys think about it. Yeah, I just, um, I don't know. I don't know if Bob Arum involved and Dana White, him and those two have clashed butted heads. So that would be the only thing that would make right. me doubt out about it but otherwise it yeah. makes sense it makes business sense it makes I don't know it could happen what do you think Tony you know what um I don't think you know with and, and Bob has you know obviously he's a shrewd businessman he's been doing this forever um but I, I don't think it would be you know we're the fight with Mayweather, Mayweather was obviously, you know, in the A-side. Um, where this one looks like, there's just like Tom said, it's almost like you're playing from behind. And you're playing from a sense of desperation, like, hey, we'll do this two-fight deal, one and one You know, it's almost like he's trying to get his guy, you know, you know, any publicity, any big name attraction that he can. But as much as I love Terrence Crawford, um, he would definitely be the B side of this equation, and uh, I don't think you know, um, you know, the fight would sell as well as the Mayweather one did, at least the boxing portion of it. The only thing that would keep it afloat would be uh, McGregor's rabid fan base or his anti fan base hoping to see him get you know knocked on his butt again. Um, but I, I don't, I don't 
know. I don't know how this would draw. Huh. We lose Tom. You there, Tom? Yeah. Well, two weeks in a row, I scared Tom away. Yes. Okay. There he is. Oh, there he is. Thank God. <laughs> I was like, whoa, what happened? Did I not pay my Yeah, all of a sudden, I thought, first, first word Tony said, and uh, everything went black. Uh -huh. I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We still got you, right? I'm here. All right. Tony, we still got you. No, I'm still here. All right. So, yeah, uh, the other thing with McGregor is, uh, well, not McGregor, but Khabib has said he wants to fight Floyd on one condition. 11 rounds of boxing, one round of MMA. <laughs> I don't think Floyd would ever agree to that. But that's his condition. Yeah, absolutely. Now, here's the other question is, where does that range? round come in. Yeah. First round, last round, middle round. Is it like a random <laughs> round? <laughs> right in the middle. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, I like Khabib's endurance. I no, would say I, I, he would want it at the very last round. 11 rounds first of boxing and then the 12th round. Well, here's the thing. Are you, are you going to be able to get to that round? Yeah. The last the time, you know, he was, he was spent by the sixth round and battered by the tenth. Yeah. So Floyd would have to knock him out to, would, to avoid that. Yeah. It, it wouldn't. Yeah, and it, and it wouldn't have mattered because what would happen? You know, it was it was over by the time that last round got to it. Yeah. So yeah, that'd be funny. Yeah, I don't think anybody would regulate that anyway. But it's just. <laughs> it's yeah, have, have the MMA in the sixth round and then see an arm partner. Go on. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and being Floyd, not knowing what the hell it is, you know, he could have his freaking shoulder dislocated or his elbow dislocated. He don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. no more. And, and, I, and I would have to think Floyd is in a position to dictate the terms. Yeah. So the big one, though, is Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao actually came out, like, after the McGregor fight and said, you know, let's do this. So that's the more likely one, uh, Pacquiao versus McGregor, <laughs> because Pacquiao is still fighting. He's not clinging to any kind of retirement, and he's in the system, you know. So and what is what does the world come to? Yeah. <laughs> Watch what the old timers would say. What is the world come to? Okay, <laughs> oh and one, and he. Don't even get yeah, me started on uh, wow. Logan Paul versus Antonio Brown. <laughs> Have you heard about that one? <laughs> uh, Antonio was so desperate for work, property. I guess. Uh, yeah, boy, there is so much raw meat for, for comedians there. So much raw meat. <laughs> Just hearing it, I'm laughing. Yeah. It's really serious, though. They're actually DAZN and everything has come out and made an offer to support it. Um, Antonio is working out, boxing and everything. And obviously, Logan Paul has a couple fights under his belt against some bum. He thinks he's the world champ of bums. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's going to be interesting. In celebrity boxing. Celebrity boxing. It's not just it. a celebrity. Uh, I, I, In this case, I, I, it's a real athlete. You know, Antonio, as much as you can knock his uh, out of the yeah. field, off the field antics, I mean, he's an athlete. So, <laughs> just like well, Logan Paul. Isn't, isn't, not really an athlete. Brown, uh, isn't, doesn't Antonio Brown ha ha have another legal situation that just popped up? Oh, yes, I he did have, this yeah. week. Um, something where he was some... I forget whose house he was at. He was assaulting police officers or throwing stuff at police officers. So, yes, he's got more than enough problems. Yep. Boy, oh, you talk about the wheels coming off. Wow. Mm-hmm. And that's true. And then there was a guy who got in trouble in the locker room for slapping somebody's ass, slapping the cop's ass. 
And so I look it up. Yeah. Thinking, oh. What's that, Odell Beckham? Yeah. I, yes. look, I look it up and go, hmm, it must have been a hot female. And it was a guy. <laughs> because he was telling people to <laughs> not smoke cigars. Odell just came up and gave me a nice little bitch slap on the ass. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, crazy stuff with these celebrities and athletes. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. We had a big upset last week in the boxing world. We'll get to the rest of the UFC card later. Uh, well, Mr. Cornflake. Right, to in Tony, right, in, yep, right in Tony's hometown. Uh, Man, that crowd was yeah. mean. Yeah, yeah. And that was a really crowd. I was watching the prelims. That is a mean, mean town for boxing. If the fans don't get what they want, <laughs> it, 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 it's crazy because you know I had um, two two of my friends that I see at the LA Fitness. They were at that card. Um, I had originally planned to go, and you know how like sometimes, and Tom, you would know this being a psychic. Uh, sometimes it's like almost like that sixth sense kicks in, and you go to do something and something tells you not to do it and synchronicity yes sir yeah really because I was talking to an old friend of mine that would used to go like that's what me he did I trained him a few times you know great guy good friend and we were talking like we've never been to a fight together I said yeah maybe we'll do this car together okay and he had texted me about two weeks ago and he's like hey you know uh, can I ride down with you guys I said absolutely you know we hadn't got to, I said listen Rob I'll get the tickets. I haven't gotten them yet. And I texted my other friend, Mike, to see if he was interested in going. And he didn't get back back to me, but then I kind of figured he was going to be watching the McGregor fight. And so I'm getting ready to order these tickets, and it's the week before the fight. And I was like talking to my mom about something, and we said something, and I was like, now i got to order these tickets. And, and once again, for some unknown reason i didn't do it and then it comes out hey man the weather might not be too good in philly um and so then we kind of backed off just to turn kind of getting a better gauge on that and that's when hank passed away so yeah. it was you know just just a matter of almost fate so i texted my friend robinson rob listen i said i hate to be the jerk and all that uh, i said um but i i don't think i'll be going saturday night you know just because so much stress with the whole week and everything, um, and and how that turned out, and the other stroke of fate, you know, um, they would where he was from, Norristown, Pennsylvania, um, you know, right close to Philadelphia. He lived around the block from my tree lot, so that's when I would visit him sometimes. Um, he, he would always do like this cable access TV show at the Norristown High School, and he, they had he had me on as a guest. Two times back in 2016, one time promoting a Sinatra night in the tuxedo, another time, you know, with the um, Philly Zephyr on. I was on it last year, and I was, um, you know, he was first in the hospital and said, okay, we're expecting him to be back soon, hopefully, you know. And I said, when he comes back, I'll be back on. So knowing how then sick he was, they called me in December to book me again. Yeah, and I said, I'll talk to you in January. They called me two weeks ago and said, hey, can we do January 15th? I said, unfortunately, we have to wait till the end of January. I'm swamped at work, and I have appointments a couple days that week. Thank God, because he died us on the 14th, where, as you guys heard me on the show last week, I mean, I was a basket case, and the guy that runs the show, who would have been interviewing me was you know all broken up you know neither of us would have been able to get through it so thankfully now we can focus and go but let's get back to the um the fight temple um here's my take on it and i was talking to some of the guys that were there tonight about this fight um you know j-rock looked good in that first round you know looked real good. I mean, he was laying in some shots. He was crisp. Um, he was on point. He looked good. Second round, 
the cut happens. And it was from a punch. And even though it looked like they had it under control in the corner, it was visibly affecting him. It was affecting him during the fight. It was affecting him between rounds. It, you could see he was pawing at it. Um, you know, he was then not letting his hands go as much. He was hesitant. Um, I don't know if it was getting in his eye. Um, but then next thing you know, you know, he started to take some big shots in the fourth round. And it's like, man, the, the tide's really turned. You know, the momentum is definitely, you know, um, turned. And then fifth round, boom. And you could see he was visibly hurt. Uh, he went down after they tussled in the clinch. And he was having a hard time getting up. So shortly after that, you know, referee made a good stoppage. And my one friend texted to me and he goes, wow. And he goes, holy shit. I said, yeah. He goes, what happened? I said, man, I don't know. I said, but that boy who's fighting, you know, was a good, strong, physical oh, fighter. And he goes, yeah, but he goes, he took Jared Hurd's punches so well. But I'm thinking, you know, and you guys will know this from, you know, our years, you know, with, with the fight game. You can take a great punch, especially if you see it coming. Now, blood getting in that left eye, and you cover your left eye, and you don't see that punch coming, it could be a punch one-tenth of the um, velocity, but you don't see it. And the punch you don't see coming, what happens? That, that's, that's the one that puts you down. Yep. Very, so I very think that, good point. That, that was my feeling on it. Yeah, and it was un- unbelievable that the crowd was booing the stoppage. Like it was premature. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was telling you, my friends, Philly, you know, Philly's a tough town. <laughs> I mean, it is. You know, and we do have a terrible reputation, you know, I, I know that. Um, no. And, and I know well, good, 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 good in some ways, Tony, good in some ways. You know, yeah, if it's a tough town, town, it's a tough town. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're very passionate and all we do in fact that was one of the things I said when I filmed that commercial two years ago I said my exact words I said my father made me a Philadelphia fan and I said and he installed in me in a young age whether you're a fan whether you're a competitor whether you're a player you give everything you got every day you know that's just our mentality and you know especially like, you know when you're um, the local homecoming guy and you have family and friends there and, you know, they think, they think you're going to come back out of this. Now, that fight had to be stopped. He was hurt. You know, he could have been seriously hurt if it went any longer. Um, it was a good stoppage. I applaud on the, uh, I think it was Benji Estevez. I applaud him on that side. Yes. Um, Great job. And, yeah, I mean, there's no, nothing else you could say or do. But I can understand the emotion of the family and the friends. Like, you know, oh, they ripped our guy off. No, they didn't. And they saved your friends. Yeah. And uh, the crowd was on Joey Spencer. Um, did, yeah. did you see the whole card, Tony? Did you watch it? I did. I did. Okay. Well, how about, no. you? How about you, Rich? I did. I did. Yeah, I didn't Rich, get to were, you, watch were you able it. to see the, the card? No, I watched. Mm-hmm. I was watching the UFC, and I got up to, like, the third fight to the last one, and I fell asleep. <laughs> so I didn't get yeah. to see anything. But, um, except the yeah, yeah. Yeah, Joey Spencer, Joey Spencer was uh, catching his share of booze, too. I mean, it looks like he was on one of I like Joey Spencer. I followed him um, since he was, you know, first round professional, and he was getting some shows on, like, you know, ESPN, maybe like a four-rounder, like a swing fight, or um, Premier Boxing Champions. Um, they were, you know, putting him on with these swing fights. Because you're right, he is a good young prospect. You know, he's 19 years old. You know, he's going to fill out, he's going to mature, um, yeah. but I think part of the, um, you know, criticism on this fight was, he's in there with the guy he's supposed to be, the guy was an awkward southpaw, so it's a harsh yeah. uh, you know, assignment for anybody, especially a young guy, um, and to make it even tougher on Joey, he's a left hooker, so with the southpaw, you know, your best um, weapon is a straight right hand, so the way to get 
think your left hook involved on that is if you're able to land the straight right hand, and then as Sean O'Grady would always say on Tuesday night fights, you got to widen the hook a little bit to get around that lead right hand. Um, and Joey wasn't able to get, you know, really any um, leverage on his right hand, and he wasn't able to get the rhythm on his left hook. So he was tepid in there, and it was a very tepid performance and not one that's going to make you want to jump up and say, I want to see this kid again. Now, from someone that's seen Joey Spencer a couple times and generally enjoys watching him fight and is interested in following his career, yes, I'm going to mark this down and say, awkward opponent, kind of threw him off his game plan a little bit, and he's going to learn from it and get better. Other people, yeah, that's like, exactly, yeah, yeah I, I would agree with you. Uh, yeah, and, and, yeah. and the counter to that would be? Yeah, what other, other people, people say about it? Yeah, other people might say, he didn't impress me, uh, I can, you know, go without seeing him again and not give him another chance. And that's a shame. You know, he's 19 years old, he's going to physically mature, he's I uh, hopefully going to get better. Uh, um, but jury's out, right? Yeah, and, and he, he closed the show pretty good. You know, he showed the power yeah. he's got there, and he finally was figuring it out. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, w- I, would, I would agree with you that it's a, it was a learning experience. I mean, he won every round. And it's easier said than done against that guy. I mean, the guy didn't have much power, but 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 still, I mean, it, it's it's just not that simple. And he, you know, he was halfway apologetic, but I think he had the right attitude toward it. Hey, this was a learning experience, and sometimes you can't get everyone out in the first round, and uh, that's a good thing. Exactly, exactly right. You know, um, I'm gonna give you um, a guy that was a Philadelphia fighter, and he's still fighting professionally. Um, he set the record. Oh, I forget who. I forget whose record he beat um, for consecutive first round knockouts to start his career. His name was Tyrone Brunson, and I watched a couple of his fights when he was first coming up. And it's like, oh my god, he's going for the record. Uh, he's at fourteen now, and I think he had to get nineteen. Nineteen consecutive first round knockouts to start your career. Well, and it's good and bad, right? It's good showing. Hey, maybe it's long guys out. You got impressive power. But even Mike Tyson early in his career was sometimes going two, three, four, and five rounds. Um, and then when his first loss, he got drug into the third, fourth round. The next thing you know, he's getting stopped. Because, hey, other guys punch back, and sometimes you don't realize that. Um, and then he had, he's had he been up and down ever since. Yeah. Well, we got... Um Another, another fight worth mentioning, Alander Alvarez got a big win. Uh, let me fight to bring him over here. <clears throat> let me but Mike, against Michael Fields? That yes. was a hell of a knockout, wasn't it? I, I did not get to see it. But if you say it was, I believe you. Oh, you didn't <laughs> see that? Ooh. Well, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 yeah I, 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 I missed didn't. that one, too. I, uh, I switched over to the McGregor card. So, okay, I didn't. I didn't get to see the knockout live. Um, you know, because by that time I started to, you know, um, doze off. You guys and then, um, and I was kind of, you know, because the first few rounds were very tepid. Like, uh, and I'm using that word a lot tonight. Um, both <laughs> those guys seemed like they were trying to feel each other out. They were very, both very cautious. And I'm like, we got two punchers in here, and they were both wary of each other's power. And then. And eventually I did, you know, doze off. And then I kind of woke up to see a guy on the canvas. I said, whoa, something must have happened. And um, I watched the replay. And Alvarez has a devastating overhand right. You can ask Sergey Kovalev about that. Um, and he hit seals with a right hand. And, and he walked away before he even hit the canvas. Because it was like, eh, I think you're done. Yeah. Nice. Those are so badass. Those walk away <laughs> knockouts. Are so badass. Uh huh. Uh. Gonna walk off home run. <sighs> anyway, uh, we got we got quite an interesting situation here this week because we have a very odd mismatch of the week. Um, there's really nothing, not much going on, on Friday. Everything's going on Saturday, and there's not too much Saturday. So, believe it or not, this is the one week we will not be able to have a Jesus fight of the week because there are no Jesuses fighting. 
according to Box Rec. Oh, boy. Believe it. This is like a record <laughs> for our show. Uh, somewhere around the world, a boxing ring is missing their Jesus <laughs> on Saturday. Somebody, some Jesus somewhere has to step up and be a TBA to fix this problem. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> got no Jesus fight of the week. Um, but we do have some other stuff. Uh, we got a mismatch of the week, too. It's kind of odd because it's against a debuting fighter, <laughs> the person that's in the mismatch. But the record is just that bad. <laughs> We're going to get to that later. But the first big fight of the week is in Minneapolis. Yeah, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. <laughs> Minnesota. That's tough to say. <laughs> Caleb Truax. He is 30 and 4 with two draws. 30 wins, four losses. Uh, finding a guy you've probably never heard of. I haven't either. David Basa Jamavul. He is 16, 4 and 1. I don't know what kind of name that is, but yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Nothing uh, nothing that great on that card other than that one fight. But the big fights are on Showtime Saturday night from Brooklyn. Walter Waits, Danny Garcia, and Ivan Redcatch. Uh, both of them have two losses in their last six. Ivan's came twice, two in a row. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they're both coming off. A solid win, so Danny. Let, let me ask this. Um, because Red catch, this is what kind of threw me off a little bit. Um, with with Ivan Redcatch, um, I mean, how long has he been moving up into welterweight? Because if I remember correctly, he was recently um that a lightweight or lower. Uh, right, because we had our, our our former guest Tony Lewis, the Tony Lewis, L U I S. Remember. Yeah. We had Tony on, and Tony was getting ready to fight Red Catch at 135. And I think Red Catch had moved up from 130. So this is, um, uh, he was saying he feels great at 147. Well, that's great, but Danny Garcia is not a cheap date yeah. by any stretch. No, he is not. You know, um, I'm pulling up Ivan Red Catch's record right now, if you can just give me a moment. Because like I said, this is... But, you know, it just threw me off a little bit um, when I saw that. Mm-hmm. And remember, Ivan, Ivan's an aggressive guy. He's going to have to go after Danny. And I don't know if that's going to work. I mean, that's kind of fight like Danny likes. You know, come to me. Come to me. I mean, it, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> I, I, but I'll say this much. It has the potential for some fireworks as long as it lasts. Yeah. No, I agree with you on that. that. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, 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 I've got to go with Danny, just based on... Uh, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, I mean, just on being you know, naturally good. You know, you, yeah, you look at his body, your work, uh, you look at the physicality, I mean, it's Danny's fight to lose, but it could it could get hairy. It could be interesting. Well, like I said, I'm looking at Red Catch's record right now, um, and he's, you know, 23 yeah. and 4, and I remember the fight against um, Tevin... Tony Lewis? Oh, okay. Uh, um, I, I remember Red Catch's fight against Kevin Farmer. Um, and I remember watching that fight, and Farmer really uh, dominated him. And I know Red Catch is a southpaw, and just like we just said, you know, two minutes ago, that could be always a challenge because, um, you know, Garcia is such a left hooker, and it's going to be hard to get that left hook in um, against, you know, a... Um, a guy that's a southpaw. You know, so Danny's going to have to focus on his right hand. So, looking at Red Catch's record, he beat Tony Lewis back in 2014, um, literally just six years ago, um, and knocked him down in the first round, and um, won a unanimous decision, won just about every round. Then, when he fought Tevin Farmer, that was in July of 2016, I remember watching it. Farmer won, um, you know, nine out of the... Um, uh, nine out of the ten rounds, and then he lost a point for a low blow. Um, you have a fight with, um, that was at 135. Um, then you had the fight with John Molina Jr., and where, you know, he, um, 
um, had Molina down, then Molina came back and knocked him out in the uh, fourth round. So now his last fight was against Devin Alexander. And Devin Alexander, this was at, you know, um, they were fighting the catch weight. You know, they were around, both around 148 pounds, which was only his second fight really above 140. And Alexander is pretty shot for him. And it was three rounds to two. Um, Alexander was winning at the time of the stoppage in the sixth round. So... Uh, I think he might be biting off a little bit more than he wants to chew uh, with Danny Garcia. And I'm thinking uh, Danny stops him around five. Yeah, that, that's, I think that's pretty accurate. And I guess uh, Red Cats would say that uh, uh, some of his struggles earlier were more with the scales than the opponent. <laughs> and you so can't, you could be right. Wow. But it, Danny Garcia is a huge, huge up. I mean, in, just in, in quality, and, and um, it's going to be a tough road for him to go. But yeah. uh, it ought to be interesting. He's if from in. somewhere Tony knows about, isn't he? <laughs> hey, Danny Garcia? <coughs> yeah, isn't he from your neck of the woods? Yeah, he's from Philly. Huh. Um, and it was funny, uh, and no, Tom, was, right you, know, you know, before we had you on as, uh, you know, our, our co-host, um... What we used to do a lot of times when we would, you know, try to get guests, especially early in our, in our, um, you know, interviewing process, the best guys we would always get would be guys that either were on the way up, they were trying to get their name out there, or guys that were, you know, kind of, you know, not being talked about much anymore. They just still wanted to talk to somebody, you know, guys wanted to, you know, rehash some of their glory days. And we were like, you know, kids in the candy store talking to these guys. Well, I remember I somehow got a hold of, um, either I got a hold of him or I got him to, like, do a Facebook message and then passed him on to Rich or something like that. But we were able to get Danny on the show no, right after he turned pro. Oh, you know, he was a world okay. he, just, he had just missed out on the Olympic um, trial. For 2008, oh. so he missed out. Like he uh, lost in like 2007. So he's like, "Well, they said, well, you can be an alternate." And he's like, "Fuck that, I'm just turning pro." And then um, he might have had two or three pro fights when we got a him. MySpace on. thing. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. When we were still with the old MySpace thing, and like, like I don't even think I had a Facebook account yet. So I was getting a whole lot of these guys on with their fight. You know, if they had like a a boxer, you know, fan page or fight page or what. Right. Whatever. And we were just adding everybody we could. Like, hey, you're in the fight game, I'll add you. You're in the fight game, I'll add you. I remember one time I got a, we got a guest. Uh, uh, because we were just putting out statuses and um what they bulletins on on, on MySpace saying, Hey, you wanna be interviewed, we'd love to interview you, we don't care who you are. Yeah. Uh, if you're associated with the fight game, we wanna talk to you. And that's how we got Larry the ring announcer. He's like, I like to talk to anybody. Right. And uh And I'll tell you um uh uh, this actually made a lot of sense to me. And uh, when we had this guy Larry on, and Larry's you know, a friend of mine, I don't get to see him anymore because he moved to Arizona, but he was a Philly guy, he was a ring announcer, he was a very good, great sense of humor. So he, we got on the air with us, and like I said, he had his laugh in, he was always like, you know, cracking jokes. I said, Larry, I said, uh, I've only ever done ring announcing a handful of times for college shows, and I was kind of pressed in at the last minute both times. Um, but I said, one of the things that bothered me, um, was, and it happened both times, uh, that I did the ring announcing, there was a bad decision. You know, we watched, in fact, here's how bad the one decision was. The ring announcers for these amateur and college shows did not get in the ring. We actually sat at a table outside of the ring and we would get on the microphone and we'd announce the fighters and then we would, you know, announce the winner. And this fight was between a Penn State guy, and excuse me, a Lock Haven guy that I knew, um, and I forget if the other guy was from Army or uh, Penn State or from wherever. The Lock Haven guy clearly wins, and I'm not being biased here. He clearly wins the fight. Tony Wolf was the referee. Tony Wolf was a very experienced, he was the head of officiating for a long time, and Tony's in the ring, and he's got 
his, the Lock Haven fighter with his left hand, the whatever fighter, uh, Army or Penn State with his right hand. And Tony's back is facing me, and I have the microphone. And I look at the cards when they gave it to me, and it had the other fighter circled on it. And it was so bad that I had to look at all of the cards to make sure they didn't hand me the wrong card face side up. You know? And I realized that the other fighter was getting the decision. And I felt it was unjust. And I felt subdued making the announcement. I said, and your winner out of the blue corner from Penn State. And it, Tony actually looked back at me. <laughs> so, and, I, and, I, and I nodded, yes. Yeah. I nodded yes. I'm like, no, I'm announcing the right guy, Tony. I'm announcing who the judges picked. And he raised the guy's hand. And I said to this guy, Larry, I said, Larry, I said, when you get a decision and you know it is clearly wrong, how do you handle it? He goes, it is not my decision to determine who won the fight. He goes, my decision, my job is to announce the winner and to give him the respect in that situation. And he goes, I cannot take away from his moment. <laughs> now, the other week, with, with that Jesse Hart-Joe Smith fight, there was a split decision. Yeah. Imagine if Jesse Hart got that decision, that he clearly did not win. How does that ring announcer announce it? You, you know? Because you know the wrong guy is getting this. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do, you do it? But he goes, you can't take away from his moment. <laughs> Even if it's a fake moment. It is what it is. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, um, yeah, Danny Garcia. We also had uh, Sean Porter back in the day. When he was like 9-0 or something like that. Yeah, we had Sean. Young and... Oh, and then I remember like a week or so later, he fought on that. Yes. Yeah. We had, a lot, we had a lot of really good guys when they were starting out. You know, that's a great... Time to get them because they weren't going to be this year. They're definitely going to get some. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, have Maureen Shea back on. She, she's been back in the female fight game. She'd be a great guest. I, I start, talk about MySpace. Jesus Christ. I probably had like 50 or 60 articles that were lost to the to the MySpace turnover <laughs> over the years. They, they said you could just email something and get your blog back, but I never was able to get my blog back. And uh, now it's changed hands like six or seven times, so who knows where that information is. <laughs> but I have yeah, right. all is, that, is, 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 is MySpace still in business? Yeah. Are they uh, still it, actually, as far as I know. Like, I don't remember my password. It's still there. I mean, I got it all friggin' memorized in my computer, so I can go back out there anytime I want. But it's like nothing there. It's like, it's like the bare bones of your profile now. That's... It's more like a music thing. It's, it's become, like a dead mob. Yeah, a, a dead mob. No, no stores, but no people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. It's nuts. Anyway, moving yeah, on apocalypse. on the Brooklyn yeah, the apocalypse card. Apocalypse happened. <laughs> we have the uh, somebody's always got to go fight in the co-main event, the WBO Intercontinental Super Bantamweight title. Although you know, with these guys' records, you'd think it'd be for something better. Uh, Stephen Fulton, seventeen and zero. Against Arnold Kagai, who is 16-0-1. And, yeah, Super Bantamweight title there. Intercontinental. That's one of those ones you got to love as an announcer. Intercontinental. <laughs> I just like saying that. <laughs> Sounded pretty good, though, buddy. <laughs> you did. Uh, we also have uh, not, not such an epic fight here, but Jared Hurd back in action. He's 23-1 and one fighting Francis. Francisco Santana, who's 25, 7, and 1. And that about rounds it out for this that week. Oh, I forgot to mention. Oh, i got to go back to box rec. There was uh, the mismatch of the week, too, before we move on to um, the MMA stuff. But while that's waiting, I'll have to reload the page. Uh, we got to talk about wrestling for a minute because uh, there's a hell of a wrestling story this week from high school wrestling of a father not liking how his son was fouled on the wrestling mat at a tournament at a local high school somewhere in uh, North Carolina. Did you guys hear about this? 
No. No? Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, wow. Yeah, look this up. Uh, I'm surprised. If you go on Facebook, it was, the day it happened, it was everywhere. So, the, uh, the father was in the stands watching his son. Looks like they're heavyweights. I mean, it's a 171, 189 or heavyweights. I don't think, I don't think they're any lighter. Um, although they're probably different weights now because they changed them, I know, since I wrestled. But uh, they're big dudes. Uh, so anyway, the opponent of the father's kid that's out there uh, slams the kid. Slams him hard, right on his neck. And uh, the father just comes out of the stand before the refs can even take a point. And I guess from the article I read, the refs were conferring and they were going to take points. But the father didn't give him a chance. He just come bowing out of the stands and tackled the kid. Uh, so he assessed the penalty immediately. <laughs> and it's like so fast, even the freeze frame is in a blur. Uh, and the guy got arrested, you know, hauled off the freaking... But the funny thing is, the wrestling matches on the other mats kept going. The referees didn't even stop the matches. <laughs> Uh, but there was a melee. There, I mean, this guy tackled him, and, you know, the coach got involved. And I mean, I don't think there was any punches thrown or anything, but, yeah, it was it was definitely heated for a little while. And, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of feel bad laughing about it because there was this, there's been plenty of instances where guys get in fights over sports and their kids and, uh, there was a Massachusetts one years ago where the guy got killed. He was on trial for I got uh, over hockey. Something with the hot to do with uh, youth hockey. And he got in a fight with the coach. He waited for the coach after the uh, practice. And he beat I, remember, him. I remember hearing about that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's dangerous. But thankfully, you know, there's a full crowd of people that saw it. So there was plenty of people to jump on the, the guy and get him off the kid. Well, yeah, it's somebody's uh, somebody's going to get banned from future competitions. He's going to have to watch on FaceTime from now on. <laughs> yeah, the whole wrestling team has a restraining order against you. <laughs> uh, he's never going to live that one down. Yeah, he's arrested for uh, simple assault and disorderly conduct. Barry Lee Jones. <laughs> anyway, that's the bizarre news story of the week, right there. Now we got to get to the mismatch of the week. Here somewhere, the fighter uh, who's expected to win, I believe, is the fighter making his debut, which is very rare. But why do you hear this guy's record? find it now. What is it? Here somewhere. I know I saw him. There it is. Okay, so this is in France. Morbihan, France. Wherever the heck that is. And uh, it's crazy because this is the only solid fight on the card. The other ones are against TBA, so they don't even know who they're fighting. But this is this is locked in stone. We've got uh, Zakaria Serrati making his debut, and he's fighting Dimitrije Djordjevic. And Dimitrije is zero twenty one and three, and he's coming fresh off. His third draw. <laughs> third draw. <laughs> <laughs> at least he's got a, a one-fight game losing streak. <laughs> so, oh, best he can man. hope for you is know, a draw it. against Zakaria here. Uh, unless you really believe in the kid. <laughs> he's looking for his first win. First win. All right, so we're going to recap the rest of the McGregor card there. We had Holly Holm getting a big win 
although it was kind of predictable, you know, more experienced kickboxer versus uh, kind of a, a journey girl, can't say journey man, <laughs> Kel Pennington, uh, you know, she's just got shorter reach, she's a shorter girl, she loves to scrap, and it's a perfect matchup for Holly to dominate, and she did. Uh, so I didn't even really get to watch that fight. <clears throat> Uh, but I'm glad I didn't because unanimous decision. I wouldn't want to have watched that because I really like Raquel. She's she's a tough, scrappy girl, and I hate to see her masked up against people that she just can't beat. She's just totally stylistic wise. It's just uh, it's like total mismatch. <coughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, that's how it went down. And then uh, Alexei Alenik, experience matters. Got his uh, armbar submission in the second round, four minutes and 38 seconds into the fight over Maurice Green. Uh, and then uh, this is the one I found. What a fight that about. was. Yeah. From what I, I read about, yeah. Uh, Alexei is just crafty. You know? Oh, you, you, you didn't. You, I didn't. Yeah, you, uh, you didn't see it, but this was, you talk about a clash of styles. Maurice Green was a monster on the feet, and he had some decent... Uh, grappling defense skills, but he, he kept it on the ground longer than he should have. I, you don't want to play the other guy's game. And uh, like you said, crafty is the word. Yeah. Crafty. My God. And he had a he had a choke in the first round. Uh, he almost burned his arms out. I don't know how he could even move going into round two. Uh, and uh, Green would not submit. It was quite the fight for Green. I mean, I'd never give up on him. Uh, don't learn from it. He's got a good good camp out there, those Colorado guys. But, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was fight of the night for me. I called him Odie, like Garfield, last week. <laughs> but his name is O'Day, I guess. O'Day Osborne. Uh, he lost by guillotine choke. First round, 2 minutes and 49 seconds in. Uh, Brian Kelleher got the job done there. And that's the one I fell asleep right before. So I saw Ferreira versus Pettis and Monteferi versus Barber. <laughs> Uh, which are both good fights. Uh, Diego Ferreira, um, he just, I mean, they were saying he was dominating, but I mean, he, he just basically was a step ahead of Pettis almost the whole fight. And then uh, the rear naked show pretty much sealed the deal. Uh, he's just Rich, a, well, what, do you, what do you think's happened to, to Pettis? I mean, he was at the top of his game uh, going back around 2014. Remember, he's on the Wheaties box. Yeah, well, I mean, I think made it a just, big deal out of that. I'm fighting, I'm fighting a Wheaties bar. It, it just caught up to him that he's been doing the same stuff, you know. Um, Duke Rufus was a pioneer back in his day when he when he was kickboxing and stuff. But nowadays, these yeah. kids they have they're so well rounded, like Adesanya and uh, a lot of these guys coming up. They they have such advanced knowledge uh, of the changing of the fight game and there's different camps and uh, different experts involved now than there were back in the day so you've got a Duke Rufus camp that does things the same way they've always done and they haven't changed much um, and they don't really do a lot of dynamic stuff uh, so the, a lot of these fighters just get stuck in their mold uh, and Pettis is one of those guys too who likes to up jab sticks his face out there uh, and thinks he doesn't have to do defense. And the guys coming up now, if they're smart, they keep their goddamn hands up. <laughs> and, and Pettis yep. will always keep one low by the hip or by his knee, and, and he pays for it. Uh, and this one happened to end by rear naked choke, but it could have ended the other way, too. And it, was, it was a pretty rough brawl uh, until the end. <clears throat> And then uh, Marta Ferry, Roxanne Marta Ferry, boy, she uh, beat her opponent bloody. And uh, this was one I was very concerned about, the corner of Macy Barber, uh, because I could have sworn after that second round, she went back to the corner and said, I'm done, repeatedly, on, on the tape. I, sw I swore that's what she was saying. And then... All of a sudden, she's talking to the ref, and she's nodding, yes, she's ready to go. Um, but, you know, when you tell your corner you're done, yeah, I get it. I, I get it. They're going to try to pep talk you in and just keep going. But, I mean, 
sometimes you gotta see that this girl's getting beat up. You don't put her out there for a third round because she don't want to go out there. <laughs> uh, so I thought that was kind of odd. And uh, I don't know. I don't know how far sh corners should go in that situation. If you really think that your fighter's got a chance, yeah, hell yeah. But Montefiore was just a beast out there. And she doesn't really do very well in the striking, usually. <laughs> You know, because she doesn't seem to have a lot of power behind her strikes. But it was just volume. It was almost like Stockton slaps coming <laughs> coming at this Macy Barber girl. Uh, because, it, and, you know, Macy had a couple elbows, but that was about it. She really wasn't fighting back that well. So, uh, Monteferi just took over and just won the unanimous decision. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting fight. Uh, Sadiq Youssef over Andre Feely by unanimous decision. Askar Askarov, uh, also by unanimous decision. Uh, we had Drew Dober over Nasrat Hakparast. That was a knockout. One minute and ten seconds in. Alexa Kamir over Justin Lede by unanimous decision. And Sabina Mazo versus JJ Aldrich. That was a split decision for Mazo. We got Bellator and Fight Night 166. And that'll do it, I think, for this week. We don't have all the news or anything. Uh, Rafael Dos Anjos versus Michael Chiesa in the co-main event. Rafael is 30 and 12. Chiesa is 16 and 5. This is fight night 166 from North Carolina. Curtis Blades in the main event. He's 12 and 2 fighting Junior. Junior Dos Santos, 21 and 6. Uh, also on the card, 10th fight of the night. Jordan Espinoza, 14 and 6 fighting Alex Perez, who is 22 and 5. Then we got Angela Hill, 10 and 7, fighting Hannah Cyphers, who's 10 and 3. Jamal Hill, 6 and 0, fighting Darko Stozik, who is 13 and 3. We got 7th uh, fight tonight, Bavon Lewis, 6 and 2, fighting Daquan Townsend, 21 and 9. Nick Lentz in the 6th fight tonight, 30, 30 and 10, with two draws, fighting Arnold Allen, who's 15 and 1. Uh, Justine Kish in the fifth fight of the night, six and two, fighting Lucy Putilova, who is eight and five. And we got fourth fight of the night, Montel Jackson, eight and one, versus Felipe Diaz Caleras, who is nine and one. And a big female fight, third fight on the card, Sarah McMahon, eleven and five, versus Lena Landsberg, who's ten and four. We got Tony Gravely, 19 and 5, fighting Brett Johns, who's 15 and 2. Herbert Burns, 9 and 2, fighting Nate Landwehr, who is 13 and 2 in the first fight of the night. And then that's it. Bellator, 238, Bud versus Cyborg. There's a big article on Sherdog about Cyborg having to overcome the way she left the UFC. I think that's a bunch of bullshit. I don't know what the guy who wrote that thinks he knows about MMA, but uh, it's, just, it's nothing to be ashamed of, the way that she left the UFC. I mean, they treated her like shit. I, you know, anybody would have left under that circumstance. So I think that's on them, not on her. But anyway, she's going again against uh, Julia Budd, big superstar for Bellator, 13-2, and two, Christian Justino. Cyborg, they call her. She is 21 and 2, and she should handle this one. She should easily go in there and take care of business. She is the big fish in the small pond officially now. So uh, I don't see a lot of people in Bellator that are going to give her any kind of a competition. But we'll see. I could be wrong. Darian Caldwell, 14 and 3, versus Adam Borix, 14 and 0. Henry Corrales, our former guest, also on this card, he is uh, 17 and 4, fighting Juan Archuleta, 23 and 2. Let's hope Henry holds on to his new teeth in this one. <laughs> Archuleta is a tough guy. Uh, another former guest of ours, talking about Pettis's. He's in Bellator now, but Sergio Pettis was another guy we had on back when he was very young. He was barely, barely into the pro ranks, I believe. Uh, but he's 18 and 5 now, fighting Alfred Kashakian, who's 11 and 4. 
We got Raymond Daniels, one and one, fighting Jason King, who's eight and five. Don't let the one and one fool you. He's a pretty crazy badass fighter. Yeah, uh, Avon Knight, also on the card, one and zero, oh, fighting Emily Geddes, who's three and four. And then Aaron Pico, up and down Pico, who's supposed to be unstoppable. Now he's four and three, <laughs> fighting Daniel Carey, who is seven and three. He was supposed to be Aaron Wonderboy Pico, and now he's Aaron almost 400. Uh, tough, tough road to hoe for him. Anyway, uh, eighth fight of the night, AJ Agazarm. He is 2-1 and one fighting Adele Altamimi, who is 8-6. and six. Yeah, we won't go through all the rest of those. Nothing too exciting there. So, I'm... Pretty sure that's about it, unless you guys got anything else to add to the agenda. No, um, that, that's it. Just looking forward to, you know, um, watching the Garcia fight this weekend. Yeah, we'll have plenty of, plenty to talk about next week, and we'll see if we're getting a guest. we got a few candidates in mind, so we'll figure it out, as they say on my favorite new show, Letter Kenny. <laughs> And we'll get back to uh, everybody beforehand and let you know. Until next week, I guess that's all, folks. Okay. All right. All right, guys. Enjoy the fights. Oh, uh, by the way, I got to see Michael Grant last week uh, um, at Hank's funeral. He came up. He came up to say hi to me. I'm like, how crazy is that? He comes up to say hi to me. (laughs) Um, But I forgot to say it was a very nice service, and. um, we sent the man out with a bang. Awesome. What a great, great, great guy. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and guys, thank, thank you for your kind words on the tribute I wrote. No problem. No problem. Appreciate it. All right. Well, have a great weekend, and we'll talk next week. All right. Adios, folks. Thanks for stopping by. All right,